Executive Director of the Baryshnikov Art Center, Sonia Kostic was a celebrated dancer at American Ballet Theater and Mikhail Baryshnikov's White Oak Dance Project. After 20 years as a professional dancer, Sonia shifted her focus to business and arts administration, first directing her own company, Other Shore, then working for Goldman Sachs before becoming the executive director of Kotzbahn Cultural Park. She credits her experiences on the stage as a strong foundation for her current work as a leader in the arts. To be a dancer, to successfully execute a step or a role, everything has to work together. So if you want the most beautiful pirouette, the feet and the legs and the arms and the neck and the head and the back, everything has to be working together. And I think it's the same thing with any organization. <laughs> You're listening to Moving Moments, the podcast that explores the dance world's most accomplished and groundbreaking artists. I'm your host, Alicia Graf Mack, Dean and Director of Dance at the Juilliard School. During each episode, you'll hear me talk with some of my closest friends and most trusted colleagues as we sit down to hear about their creative process and how they are changing the dance world on and off the stage. The last time I saw you here in New York City was actually here at the Brishnikov Art Center. We're having the conversation now from the administrative offices. And I walked into the Jerome Robbins Theater, and you were standing right there with Mikhail Brishnikov, and I thought, this is where she should be, right here <laughs> next to, to Brishnikov. What is it like to now live even more closely to, to his legacy and his vision for the arts. You just said it, it's incredibly exciting. It's an enormous honor. I have the utmost respect for Misha and it's also sort of a miracle in many ways. I met him when I was 15 years old auditioning for ABT's school, which you know was a life many, many lifetimes ago mm -hmm. and I never, in my wildest dreams would have ever imagined that one day I would be working alongside him as executive director of his incredible art center. So it's been a long road for <laughs> sure and many twists and turns, but I am so grateful to be here. He is one of the greatest figures in our history as an artist, as a performer, but also now as someone who is supporting future generations of artists. And I have so much respect for him because he cares so deeply about dance and the arts and artists. You talked uh, just a bit about meeting him when you were 15. And I wonder if you could illuminate for our audience how you started your journey in dance and the arts in the first place. I may have mentioned this to you before, but I was adopted from Korea when I was two years old, and I was very blessed to be adopted by the most incredible parents who both loved the arts immensely. Neither of them were artists per se, you know, as a profession, but were certainly artistic as human beings. And I do remember a story that my mom told me that when I stepped off the airplane being brought over from Korea that I did have this sign around my neck that said appears to like music, which I think thrilled my parents because they were enormous music lovers and as well as dance. And so they put me in dance classes. I think I was three when I started, but they also put me in violin lessons and piano lessons and I did theater and I was very fortunate to really be exposed to all arts when I was very young and then in a very typical fashion for anybody who is seriously studying dance. I moved to New York when I was 15 to study at School of American Ballet. Mm -hmm. And then my second year, Misha started a school affiliated with ABT and it was an incredible opportunity. There were only 12 students in the school. It was the last two years he was artistic director of ABT, and I was in it the first year, and then he invited me to join the company after that. How did dancing make you feel when you were younger? Well, looking back and maybe intellectualizing it a little bit more, I came from Korea when I was two years old to Minnesota, which is where I grew up, a very Scandinavian-looking demographic. 
and uh, my family itself was also quite diverse. My sister was from Vietnam, my brother was from former Yugoslavia. Actually, mm -hmm. my father was also from the former Yugoslavia. And so we grew up with the, the traditions and the holidays, and we were even on the old calendar. So I grew up in a very Slavic family and clearly don't look Slavic <laughs> and did not come from that originally. And I think being in the arts and dance specifically, you just have this capacity to immerse yourself into something that extends beyond an ethnicity. And I felt so welcome in the arts. And I was very fortunate, again, because Minnesota and Minneapolis has a thriving art scene. I started at the Children's Theater and then moved to Minnesota Dance Theater and Lois Holton and just was so completely embraced with warmth and acceptance. And it was just such a wonderful environment to grow up in as a child, to have artistic freedom and encouragement. And you know yourself, being on stage and performing, those moments, everything dissolves and you are just in that moment. And that is who you are and no explanation is needed. Even if your mind doesn't fully understand what that means, you know that that is your place and that is who you are. And that is a strong enough feeling that it propels you forward into pursuing that as a life. Amen to that. <laughs> you actually answered one of the questions that I ask all of the guests on this podcast, and that is, what does that moving moment of performing feel like? And you articulated that so beautifully. Thank you. I hope so. <laughs> it's hard to explain sometimes because yeah. it is so much that feeling, and it's actually the removal of everything. Could you just give us an idea of how you made the leap from being a student to then becoming a professional dancer? Because I think there is something that has to shift in your mind or a growth that you have to have mentally and artistically. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I don't know if I fully understood that transition from student to professional when I was actually going through that. For so many dancers, especially going into ballet companies, you're so young. When Misha asked me to join ABT, I was still only 16. Wow. Uh, when I actually officially joined the company, I had just turned 17. But, you know, you're still in high school. So I still had this connection to high school. And I was very much that type of person who was really fascinated and interested in the world at large. So things that were going on outside of ballet as well. ABT was my dream company. Mm -hmm. And I had pictures of all the principal dancers and all of that. And so getting into the company was an absolute dream come true. But I don't know if I fully grasped what it meant to be a professional. You're so young when you get into these companies, there isn't any sort of like formal train. I mean, things may be different now actually, but my experience, and this was in the 80s, mm -hmm. there was no formal training of how to suddenly be a grown up. That was a big challenge to be granted this enormous opportunity to dance with one of the greatest companies in the world and alongside some of the greatest dancers in the world and not really understand how to be a professional. Mm -hmm. Your life as an artist and a dancer took many different turns. So how did you find your way? I mean, it's really, it took time. There were no shortcuts, you know? And because I went through all of those, I am now able to be in my current place in life, having gone through quite a bit. I started out as a classical ballet dancer, dancing with ABT, but over the course of my 24-year dance career, um, I had really very diverse experiences. So I started at ABT, and then I went to San Francisco Ballet. I went to Zurich Ballet. I danced in ballet companies for about 10 years. But then the latter 10 years of my dance career, I was a freelance dancer, mm -hmm. which back in the 90s, I wasn't a star by any means. Um, it was a really interesting learning experience. I had to really advocate for myself. There was no internet. 
There were no cell phones. So it wasn't like you could just Google things or email somebody. It took a lot longer for things to happen, yes. to communicate, to travel, to you know, audition. Those, to audition. You can't send a video. No, same but even like now. to find out what was going on, right. you know, in other parts of the world. There was no internet to just Google and find out. So I had to learn how to, you know, build my career as a freelance artist. Can you talk about your time creating and building Other Shore? Sure. So that was coming towards the end of my professional performing career. Within my 10 years of freelancing, I worked a lot with the director, Peter Sellers. I also danced with Misha's White Oak Dance Project. So being around really creative, entrepreneurial people inspired me to co-found and co-direct a New York City-based modern dance company, and it was for dancers, run by dancers. Mm -hmm. And everybody who was involved with Other Shore were mature dancers. Mm -hmm. They had had already their prime years, and we commissioned all brand new pieces. We had Other Shore for six years, mm -hmm. and it was a wonderful experience. But the funny thing is, Having Other Shore was immediately derived from being a dancer. I had zero experience running a company. I knew nothing about business. I didn't know what a budget was. I didn't know what a spreadsheet was. I barely knew how to use a computer. So it's very interesting what could be accomplished over those six years of having Other Shore with almost no understanding of what I was doing. But because of that, that is actually what led me to decide to go to business school. And I won't deny that it wasn't scary to go to school. I graduated from high school 20 years prior, and I never went to college getting into ABT while still in high school. It was really my partner who said, you seem to really enjoy having a company, even though you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, you should take a couple business classes to just give you an idea. And I thought, you know, I never went to college. It was something that my parents really wanted me to do. So I went when I was 38, graduated when I was 42, undergrad, and it was one of the best choices I've ever made in my life. There's nothing more inspiring to me than to, to learn new things, and school has just that incredible environment for learning. And when I, when I went to undergrad business school, I majored in accounting, and back then I had no idea what accounting was. I remember my very <laughs> first accounting class just thinking, what did I get myself into? It was so not intuitive. But by the time I finished, I absolutely loved it and I just wanted to go all the way with it. So even going a step further from business school, I went then to work at Goldman Sachs, which was just the most <laughs> thrilling experience. What did you find working in a different industry? What were the things that you brought from your time as a dancer, from your sensibility as a dancer? coming into that space? I think what I discovered is that every company, whether it's for-profit, non-profit, finance, dance, everybody is trying to tell a story. So that really lent itself when I went to work at Goldman because in many ways it's no different. You are given, you know, whatever set of numbers and you have to tell a story about it. And it has to be relatable, it has to be understood. You have to interest people, you have to inspire people, and to think about who is my audience. Mm. That I think is probably the only difference. If you are in a dance company or you're working for an arts organization, you may have one type of audience. If you're working for a corporate organization, a finance organization, you've got another audience. My dream for Bershnikov Arts Center is to have an audience that includes everybody. Yeah. So I would love for Brezhnikov Art Center, you know, for the artists that we support in residencies or the artists that we produce in performance, that we are able to gather together a diverse audience from all different kinds of worlds. Mm -hmm. They're working together to move forward the mission. And I think it is so important that 
the people that you work with, that it really is about working with them. I use this example a lot, but it's so, it resonates so much with me and it comes very much from a dancer's perspective, but to be a dancer, to successfully execute a step or a role, everything has to work together. So if you want the most beautiful pirouette, the feet and the legs and the arms and the neck and the head and the back, everything has to be working together. If any of those parts aren't working, you don't get that perfect pirouette. And I think it's the same thing with any organization. In being the leader, someone who is responsible for setting the vision, how do you communicate that? How do you engender that sort of culture within an organization? I think it is a very collaborative thing. It's so exciting when all of that comes together and you can feel that. It's very much like being a performer when you're on stage and you feel that energy from your fellow dancers and from the audience and it's just all of that working together. Very much the same for running an organization and moving that organization forward. Well, I was going to ask you, in your roles as an administrative leader, have you felt that same sort of high or satisfaction as you would as a performer but you answered that question I, I often ask myself sometimes in my role at Juilliard do I feel the same sort of fulfillment that I did as a performer it's much different much different I can't compare the actual feeling but the same sense of anticipation and excitement and work and collaborative efforts to make the thing and to see the vision through is thrilling. I have a, a question around race. I often wonder if, as a field, we're having enough conversations about Asian dancers, Asian artists in the field. What do you think about that? Growing up American and being from Korea, and like I said, I grew up actually in a very Slavic family, so my identity has always been a little confusing. <laughs> and for dance, you know, in many ways, looking back, I was in many ways sort of that token Asian, but it was never spoken about before, right. really. And it wasn't spoken about, so I never really thought about it in many ways either. And I will say in Misha's ballet school that was affiliated with ABT, it was only 12 students, and it was such a diverse school. It, there was a Korean, there was a Chinese boy, Hispanic woman, a black dancer, someone from Morocco. It was more diverse than, than you would ever imagine. And even back then, it was not talked about, you right. know? In today's world, there's definitely more conscious thoughtfulness put forward towards it, which is really wonderful to see. I think there are actual conscious efforts being made, which is great. I mean, for dance, it's such a universal language that it should absolutely be for everyone. Yes. If you look back 10 years from now, what would you say would bring you a sense of success? Well, I think having this opportunity to work with Misha and the rest of the BAC team, we are working towards moving BAC forward, developing it, ensuring that we can continue to support artists in a really significant way. And I'm already shocked, just absolutely wowed by how much support BAC gives artists. And so I want to get the word out about that. Mm -hmm. And I want to continue building on these programs that BAC already has, continue diversifying the programs so that we can diversify our audiences. My last question is not so much about your role here at Bershikoff Art Center or your life as a dancer, but in general. What has brought you joy and when you wake up in the morning, what are you grateful for? That's such a hard question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, I mean, I think the reason why that's such a hard question is it feels like such a personal question. And those are those things that aren't ever vocalized. So how to put it into words. But I am so grateful for so much. Life is a miracle and I'm so grateful for everything my entire life and how I've gotten here and not everybody has freedoms and opportunities and 
the ability to choose what they want to do with their life. And I'm so grateful for my family, extremely grateful for my partner who has been along my side through thick and thin over the past couple decades. Right now, I wake up every morning so excited about this new job I have at Brishnikov Art Center and what we get to do here. Um, yeah, I feel very blessed. Well, thank you so much for being with me for Moving Moments. And I know that in time, we'll sit down and have another conversation about what you have achieved here. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's always so wonderful to get to talk to you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Moving Moments. If you like what you heard, please tell your friends about it. Spread the word. Be sure to follow the show, rate us, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up with future episodes, follow us on Instagram at Moving Moments Podcast and visit us at artfulnarrativesmedia.com. Tune in next week as we hear another inspiring artist's moving moments.